Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the webinar. My name is Sean Rogers, and I'm with the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Before turning the webinar over to the featured speakers, I'd like to briefly talk through a couple of house cleaning items about how the webinar is going to work, and then take a brief moment to tell you just a little bit about the National Reentry Resource Center. Anytime during this webinar, you can ask a question by typing it into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. We will keep a running list of the content-related questions that we receive, and then ask the panelists to respond to the questions during the last segment of the webinar. We will do our best to get through as many of the questions as possible. If you encounter technical or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. And in just a moment, I will, uh, I will chat that number to you. Uh, please understand that there are some technical issues you may not be able to resolve. For this reason, we are recording this event and will post it on our website at www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org. We should have the webinar posted online late this week or early next. And once it has been posted, we will email you a link to the recording. The National Reentry Resource Center is now in its third year, and it was established by the Second Chance Act to provide education, training, and technical assistance to states, tribes, territories, local governments, service providers, nonprofit organizations, and corrections institutions working on prisoner reentry. The Resource Center is administered by the Council of State Governments in partnership with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice. This is a snapshot of the Resource Center's home page. We are constantly adding new content and resources to our website and we send out a monthly newsletter that provides information about the latest research, funding opportunities, distance learning events, and other news about reentry. To sign up for the newsletter, please visit www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org after today's webinar. I'd now like to turn the webinar over to Ann Jacobs. Ms. Jacobs is the director of the Prisoner Reentry Institute at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Ms. Jacobs? Thank you very much, Sean. I'm very pleased to be participating in this program today, um, sponsored by the National Reentry Resource Center. Today we're going to be discussing overcoming community resistance to reentry housing, or NIMBY, the way that many of us refer to it, not in my backyard. I suspect that no one in our very considerable audience today, and I understand we had over 900 um, pre-registrants, really needs to be convinced of the importance of stable housing for people returning to the community after incarceration. I suspect we all know um, a great deal from our own personal experience about the difference that community opposition can, can make to trying to do what we think makes sense in reentry. Um, at best, it absorbs a great deal of energy, time, and goodwill. At worst, community opposition can stall or stop projects from being realized. And unfortunately, the way that conversations evolve, it too often perpetuates stereotypes that get into the way of our work, the work of, of helping formerly incarcerated people reintegrate into society. This topic is a subject of a toolkit that was developed with the assistance of the Bureau of Justice Assistance by the Fortune Society and the John Jay College Prisoner Reentry Institute with contributions from the International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution at Teachers College, Columbia University. So we urge you to um, download this toolkit from either the Fortune Society or John Jay College Prisoner Reentry websites. Um, today, we're going to have the opportunity to hear two success stories, examples of organizations that have worked effectively with their communities and as a result have produced badly needed housing for formerly incarcerated people. First, we're going to hear from Alvin Ensminger, who was a resident of the Fortune Society's castle and now resides in Castle Gardens. Alvin was released and paroled to the academy. After about a year, he applied and transitioned into living at Castle Gardens. 
He started as a volunteer at the Fortune Society teaching GED and then went on to be an employee of Fortune Society in that capacity. Now he teaches at LaGuardia Community College and Lehman College, teaching math in the Adult Learning Center of CUNY at the City University of New York. He assists people working toward their GED. He's also an Alternatives to Violence facilitator, conducting community workshops on combating violence for youth and for adults. Right now, he's working on the development of a program for parents and children together. Mr. Ensminger was recognized by the New York State Division of Parole for rising to the challenge and achieving your goals, making your opportunities endless, becoming an asset to your community. After listening to Mr. Ensminger, we're going to hear from Joanne Page. Joanne Page has been the Executive Director of the Fortune Society for 23 years. Under Joanne's stewardship, Fortune Society's innovative initiatives have become models for similar programs across the country. Their programs include alternatives to incarceration, reentry services, HIV case management, drug treatment, and mental health services, as well as the two housing programs that she'll be talking about today, the Fortune Academy and the um, Castle Gardens. Um, you should know that with the Academy, Joanne took an abandoned drug den and an eyesore to the community and turned it into a place of hope and understanding. While this project was initially met with resistance from the community, it has since been embraced. Those who were once outside the building waving picket signs are now inside breaking bread with the residents. So her story, um, as she'll tell it today and is represented in the toolkit that I talked about earlier, is very um, instructional. For those of us not just trying to place housing in communities but deal with community opposition, sometimes to drug treatment and other kinds of social services that, that we would like to cite. Um, and finally, we're going to hear from Bob Doherty. Bob Doherty has been the executive director of St. Leonard's Ministries in the near west side of Chicago for almost 25 years. He claims to be a recovering English teacher who spent many happy years in the classroom at all levels prior to coming to St. Leonard's. During his time as executive director, as the numbers of individuals imprisoned in Illinois grew, so did the programmatic responses from St. Leonard's Ministries. Today, St. Leonard's provides comprehensive residential, case management, and job development services to more than 500 men and women each year. And after hearing from the three of our speakers, we will open it up to your questions and to discussions among um, the panelists. So welcome. I'm glad you're here. And Alvin, I wonder if you will please um, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Anne. Thank you. It is truly an honor for me to be here today, and I thank you for allowing me to be part of this webinar. Uh, yes, my name is Alvin Ensminger, and I would like to begin by saying that I served 23 years of a 25-year sentence uh, in New York State um, Correctional Facilities. Uh, 23 years was long and hard, but after four trips to the parole board, I was given a date for release. Uh, my release date was scheduled for August of 2009. While the 23 years was hard, I am now faced with where am I going to live, what am I going to eat, what clothes am I going to wear, and um, this is a new level of stress for me. Uh, the public library puts out this book called Connections, and it was through this book, on the first page of this book, that I found an organization called the Fortune Society, and um, I wrote them a letter, and um, after a couple of letters, I had met through the mail, Glenn Martin. Uh, it was arranged where I could make a phone call to Glenn, and um, I had intakes right over the phone. And after a couple of phone conversations, it was Al Ensminger coming from prison to fortune. And that was the beginning of a very fruitful uh, reentry for me. Uh, I was released to the castle of the Fortune Academy in August of 2009 uh, from prison to the academy. The stress of where I'm going to live, what I'm going to wear, what I'm going to eat was totally eliminated. The academy took care of all of this for me. I was able to um, 
attend community meetings, um, support, support groups within the academy. Uh, all of the mandates that pro said, the pro said you would need anger management or drug um, rehabilitation. The academy took care of all those things for me. I was able to finish my mandated programs by parole and um, do all the things that would help me be a productive member of society. Um, as Anne has said earlier, I had, after finishing my programs, I had started to volunteer for Fortune as a GED uh, tutor. And I did that for several months, and um, eventually the uh, primary teacher uh, moved on, and I was hired by Fortune as a part-time GED instructor. And I'm proud to say that um, during my year and a half here, um, there were various, uh, well, several uh, diplomas um, that came out of my class, and um, I was very happy for that. While well, at the academy, um, you know, just being in a safe environment, um, that, that meant so much to me. It's like not just a supportive environment, like supporting you to do your, your programs and stuff, but they really, they give you the tools. They give you the tools uh, to, to, for you to do the right thing. And, and if a person is really serious, it's really, they really make it easy for you. But you have to do the work. And that's what I did. I had to do the work. I spent a year in the academy, and um, it was a fruitful year. I learned a lot. I met a lot of people through the case managers, through the um, uh, counselors. I mean, the academy was really, like, very, very instrumental to my um, being having a successful reentry. After approximately a year in the academy, the Fortune Academy, it was time for me to move on to transitional housing, permanent housing. And I had a choice. Where am I going to live now? Um, and at this time, the Fortune, the Castle Gardens was just about to open. And uh, learning a little bit about Castle Gardens, I said, you know what? I can stay right here at Fortune. I'm looking at, I'm looking at this, and this is my community from where I, where I left when I first got arrested. So I'm really back in my community. I literally came home. So living in the Castle Gardens was like, a green building, a brand new building, clean, safe. Uh, it was, oh man, it was like a, a dream come true. The computer lab, the laundry room, these are other things which eliminates a lot of the stress um, of what are you going to do, you know, how are you going to live. Um, the Castle Gardens is uh, being a, a green building, and um, out of that, or living somewhere else within the community, I can take my, my, my pick. Do I want to do this or do I want to do that? There's nothing like the Castle Gardens, and I lived in that community. So it's like um, very, very um, supportive, and uh, I'm living there now. I've been there for a year, and it is a beautiful, beautiful building. And I thank Fortune for allowing me to uh, make that smooth transition. Um, while living at the uh, Castle Gardens, I went on to um, start working for LaGuardia College, teaching GED, and uh, also Lehman College. And um, this, again, is um, a part of what it takes for one to do the right things when you have the support, the support team, like family, friends, Fortune Society. It really made it easy for me. So... Um, what I would like to say is that after serving 23 years in prison, coming home and living in a safe environment where I could work on myself, do the things to help me be a productive member of society, the, 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 really, the bottom line is that today, for the first time in over 25 years, I am a tax-paying citizen, a free man, and I am accepted in my community. And I say this with great honor because like the academy itself in Castle Gardens, I know there was a time when they say, not in my backyard. Well, when you look at us now and they see us, they see people like me and people that's living in the castle now, they welcome us with open arms. And if I can just speak about a, a, a Halloween experience I had last year, uh, over a thousand children came through the academy uh, so that we could, you know, we have a haunted house in, in, in the academy. And they bring their kids to us 
so that we can scare them and, and give them candy. So do they do do they embrace do they embrace us? They welcome us with open arms. We help the community. We'll shovel snow. We'll help uh, people with groceries. And yes, they love us there. And um, I'm just glad to be a part of that. To say that I'm a constructive, productive member of my community. I say that with honor. And um, I'm just so happy that fortune has made this possible. So again, the bottom line: I am in a community where, when I left, I was doing a lot of negative stuff. I come home, and I'm doing the right thing, and I'm embraced with open arms, and I love every day of my um, freedom on the outside. And again, I thank Fortune for being supportive and helping me, and um, it's just an honor to continue to do the right thing, and I am happy to be a part of this webinar. Um, so I say thank you, and uh, allowing me to share this experience, and um, I would like to turn this over to... Joanne, and um, again, um, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this webinar. Hello, this is Joanne, and thank you all for joining us. So what we do is we rely on our residents to be our ambassadors, and Alvin has just described how he's been part of the community as well as part of our residents. Uh, so a little bit of background on the Fortune Society. We started it in 1967. Uh, we started as a self-help organization. I'm trying to get you on the right slide. There we are. Okay. Uh, we saw about 3,000 men, women, and young people coming out of incarceration or entangled in the criminal justice system. And to be eligible for our services, you need to be formally incarcerated and looking for help. That's pretty much all that it takes to be eligible. Uh, we're both a direct service and an advocacy organization. And the anchor to the place is that we're a self-help organization. Uh, we had a nickname for Alvin. We called him the Super Tutor because he helped a good number of people make it through to their GEDs. And our philosophy is that you come in and get the help that you need, and then you reach back and help the next person. Most of our staff are formally incarcerated, which gives us some really powerful role modeling. And what we've done over time, because we have a commitment, to meet the needs of people who walk in our door who have criminal justice engagement, regardless of whether we have funding for the services that they need, we'll either settle down with them and offer them the services, or we'll help them find them in the community. And where they're not in the community, or where they don't welcome our clients, we work hard to either create them ourselves or help build them elsewhere. So over time, we've grown enormously. We now have alternatives to incarceration services, employment services, training programs, a school from literacy through GED, uh, licensed drug treatment, just added licensed mental health services. And we backed into housing. We did not see ourselves as a housing organization, but we felt we really needed to provide housing because our clients needed it so badly. We went through a three-year strategic planning process. And what we realized is that even if we would be in learning curve, we couldn't do worse than what our clients were facing in the absence of what we were trying to create, especially for clients who had violent convictions or no drug-free clean time. Uh, there was just about nothing out there that would give them a fighting chance toward making it in the community. So we engaged in a five-year plan to create housing for our clients. This is the building that we bought. Uh, we were blessed by the real estate gods. We bought this building at the right place in the real estate market. The slide to the left is what the building looks like when we got it. Uh, this had been a Catholic girls' school built in 1913 in West Harlem. It's one of the first buildings that you see as you enter Manhattan because it's right on the West Side Highway. And the city had taken it by eminent domain to turn it into a tuberculosis hospital just as the epidemic was waning. So they abandoned it. And when we got the building, it had been abandoned for over 20 years. It had uh, crack files crackling on the floor when you walked in. Um, the backyard was an empty lot with major drug dealing going on. There was a homeless man living on the third floor. Um, the ice on the sidewalk had not been shoveled for 20 years. And when we went and bought this building on the open market, 
Our neighbors were more scared of us than they were of what they had, and we hit enormous opposition. So the two slides you see are the inside of the building in its abandoned glory, and then the outside of the building as we purchased it. No glass in the windows. There was a tree growing out of the roof and a bat colony in the basement, but you can't see those. And you can see our staff in the front. Then we opened the castle, known as the castle in the community. We called it the Fortune Academy because we realized that people would be learning how to live in the free world in this place. And our theory was that we would have three phases of housing. In the castle, we'd have emergency housing, short term, long enough for people to get a legitimate source of income and stabilize themselves and see what they needed. And then longer term housing, phased permanent, we call it, uh, for as long as they needed it to stabilize. And this is a term of art. We invented it because we couldn't find transitional housing money. So we called this phased permanent housing, meaning permanent for the phase, this phase of the person's life so that we could access permanent housing money. And then the third phase was to be permanent housing with supports and follow-up in the community. For many of our residents, that was possible. But what we found for other residents is either that they were not ready to come into the community on their own or they needed more support. But that's part of what happened later. So we walked into a neighborhood that had a real public safety menace on its hands and that was more scared of us than it was of what it had. And we learned a lot about dealing with the, the, the syndrome of not in my backyard. Uh, there's a term in New York called banana that's applied to affluent communities that oppose pretty much any kind of development. And BANANA is an acronym. It stands for build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. That was not the community we were in. We were in a community that had fair share issues. And what that meant was that they were saying that they had more than their fair share of programs that brought troubled people into the community. They had a history in our West Harlem community, of being unable to keep programs out, feeling exploited, feeling powerless, and being the victims of what I call hit-and-run human services, where a program would come in, would make many promises, and then would put fragile people or high-risk people in the community and just simply abandon them there. What we had to do was prove that we were not going to do that. Essentially, we needed to prove that we would be good neighbors and that we would make the community safer as a result of our being there. So the first thing we did, and we were told this by a consultant, is that we would never get community board approval for the use that we wanted to put the building to. So we needed to search for real estate that was zoned as of right for what we needed. We did that. We bought on the private market, and we had the right to develop the building because we were using it for precisely the purpose that it had been used for before. It was an educational institution with residents on it, and we were zoned for that. But we knew how important it was because of our own values and because we wanted our clients to be accepted in the neighborhood. We knew how important it was to be a good neighbor, and that was our goal. What we started doing as soon as we purchased the property was – to let everybody know that we were there and to make ourselves available for any meetings that anybody wanted to have with us anywhere. Some of them were really hot. I remember being in the basement of the building with 500 people shouting at me and a woman standing up against the wall and saying, you're bringing these people in to rape us and to rape our children. One person had something positive to say and they disconnected the microphone cord. What was important, though, was to keep doing those meetings. We met in people's living rooms. We met at the community board. We created a community advisory board, and we populated it with our neighbors, including people who opposed our being there. We attended six meetings a month in the community, four community board meetings, the police precinct meeting, the Friends of Riverbank State Park. And, in fact, we bought the building, the shell of the building, in 1998, we still, in 2002, 
attend those six meetings. We learned a lesson, though, and that was that we did not meet the full needs of reaching out to the community by reaching out only to the established sources of power and community input. What we realized is that this West Harlem community of ours had an African-American power structure, but it had many Latino residents who felt disenfranchised and were not at the community board meetings. So we had to broaden our reach to reach them as well. And we spent our time planning, meeting, talking, working on being good neighbors. Um, Alvin referred to the haunted castle. One of our residents in the first year said, you know, for Halloween, why don't we do a haunted castle? And we've done it ever since with about a 1,000 children coming in a year. We also opened the place up to the community, and we said, welcome in. Anytime you want to come by and say hello, do that, and our residents will show you around. And we also promised the community that they would be safer for our being there, and we've gone out of our way to make sure that that's true. So fast forward. We did this building on a five-year plan. We purchased the property in 1998. After a good deal of looking around, we opened the doors in 2002. And as time went on, we realized that we needed the third phase of our housing on premises. We needed permanent housing. So we looked at the empty lot behind us, and we said, it's time. We need to create our own housing. What we found was that when our residents looked for permanent housing, some were able to find it. Some didn't have the income. Some were unable to find housing because of the nature of their criminal history. And some just needed more support than we could offer at a distance. So what we did was we started planning about what to do with the empty lot. Permanent housing, yes. But when we met about this with our community advisory board, we got a really interesting response. Note that these were people who had opposed us initially. And what we found was that they were saying something to us that was very clear. We like what you're doing. We value you being in the community. But we have housing needs, too. We need housing that is available for very low-income families. And we want part of it. So we redesigned our thoughts. And what we ended up with was the idea of mixed-use housing, to bring the community in. We wanted a green building. We wanted a building that mixed our clients with members of the community and that met the needs of both. This is a picture of our green roof as we planned it. It's beautiful and it's green. And what we faced when we had started with NIMBY was the opposite. We got YIMBY, yes, in my backyard, with tremendous community buy-in, partly because we built trust over a decade partly because what we did was we listened to the neighborhood and what we did was we created something that spoke to their needs as well as to the needs of our clients. So we did another five-year plan, two years of planning, 18 months of fundraising, 18 months of building. What we ended up with was, depending on how you count it, 11, 12, or 13 funding sources of all sorts, federal, state, discretionary, competitive, private, all kinds of money, $43 million we raised it in 18 months. The building to the left is our original castle. The building to the right is our new building, Castle Gardens. And the vision for that was 114 apartments. 50 of them are affordable housing for the community. 63 of them are supportive housing for our clients. And one is the apartment of our live-in superintendent who also happens to be one of our graduates. The biggest lessons we learned were about building trust in the community and being a good neighbor, and about, as we went to our second leg of the journey, taking the needs of the community into account as we started thinking about what to do with our empty lot so that we were meeting their needs as well as ours after we built the trust that made them want to be part of it. So this is a picture of the groundbreaking. and just to see the kind of support we ended up with, having started as an organization that no elected official wanted to be connected with while we were trying to build trust in the community. 
The mayor's there, our city council member is there, the speaker of the city council is there, our borough president is there, our congressman is there, some of our clients are there, our investors are there, and we now have a building that people fought to be part of. The 50 affordable housing units that we had had over 2,000 applications. The story of it, for me, is rather simple and rather moving. The people who opposed us most were the long-term residents of the community who really cared about the community. And they became our biggest supporters once they realized we were making the community safer. And then they became even bigger, bigger supporters when we crafted our next building to meet their needs as well as the needs of our clients. So this is the information for contacting us. The um, toolkit is something that I think you might find of value, and it's both on our, to on our website and on the, Jan Jay, on the John Jay website. So thank you very much, and I pass it on to the next person. Good afternoon. This is Bob Doherty speaking now. I'm the Executive Director of St. Leonard's Ministries, located on the near west side of Chicago, Illinois. Our story is a bit different than the castle. We've been located in the same community for uh, soon to be 60 years. Our doors were opened in 1954 on a very small scale by uh, a perhaps more practical and pious Episcopal priest who was chaplain at the county jail and realized that people were getting out of jail on Friday and going back on Monday, not because they were inherently evil, but because they had few resources. So he pulled together enough money to buy our first house, which is, uh, he purchased it for the amazing sum of $12,000, and with that, St. Leonard's Ministries uh, began its, its history. Uh, for several years, uh, we remained just a program to help provide services for men, then in the late 80s and early 90s, as our programs for men were growing, St. Leonard's House uh, became a residence for 40 men. We realized that we also needed to be addressing women who were at the time a disproportionately fast-growing population in Illinois prisons. So in 1994, we opened Grace House, our women's program. These two programs are what we call first response. Now, with continuum of care language and HUD language and all the other funders that you have to please, um, you come up with a number of different service descriptions over the years. But for us, St. Leonard's House and Grace House remain first response housing settings for men and women exiting prison. And the stay with us at either of these programs is dependent upon an individual's needs. It varies anywhere from six months to a year. And during those uh, uh, periods of time, while people are at Grace House or St. Leonard's House, our goal is stabilization and identification of needs and, and planning for a safe and complete reentry into the community. We realized in the early 90s that while our provisional housing was good, our first response housing, we needed to do longer term housing for the people who came to us. So. In 1999, we opened St. Andrew's Court, which is permanent housing, permanent supportive housing for men, with 42 units located here on our campus. Our women's program is located a few blocks away, but close enough that we can share resources. So for us, the jump into the permanent housing was, was a major jump. We had done a pretty good job at this emergency housing type setting with uh, tight programming, but we had to get help, and we, we got some help from what was done Lakefront SRO, no Lakefront Mercy Housing Corporation, to develop our, our, our long-term permanent housing. It was a real leap for us, um, and, and we too, uh, Joanne used the term backed into housing, we too felt kind of backed into the housing thing because we saw ourselves as a relatively small agency that handled emergency setting carefully, but going into housing opened up many new doors for us. Uh, but we found it very well worth it. Uh, we've never had an empty spot in, in all these years that St. Andrew's Court has been in existence, and it's been a, just a tremendous stepping stone for the men who've come through our program. Now, I have to suggest that, that our setting is, is different, not only in, in the, the size um, compared to the castle, but also in, in the, 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 the community that we're in. When we came here 54 or 58 years ago, um, the community was a, a very traditional 
middle class setting. Then it went through a number of urban changes, and 20 years ago, uh, public housing uh, really defined the community in which we live. Some the Henry Horner homes, some really uh, difficult public housing settings. So as the Henry Horner homes were destroyed in the late 90s and early 2000s, then other people came into the community, and they came into the community with the, the expectation that it would become um, a very uh, high economic uh, described community. But what has happened then, especially in the latter part of, of the, the decade of 2000, the first two, 10 years of 2000, 2007, 2008, property values, uh, as we all know, have uh, diminished. So we have an interesting community in that we have some people who've been here for 50 years who stayed when public housing was dismantled, and we have other people who moved into the community. And those are pretty clearly the lines uh, with which you can draw those people who are in favor of St. Leonard's Ministries and those who aren't. So people who've been in the community forever uh, stand stalwartly in favor of us, and they are in support of just about everything we do. When we uh, were beginning to do St. Andrew's Court, our permanent housing in um, 1999, 98, 99, we had a number of community meetings, and one after another, people said, well, I don't care what St. Leonard's does, they help people, let them do it. So that was the, the time in, in which our, our permanent housing was built. So the other side of the community represents people who, as I say, got uh, a fairly good deal on housing and new housing and some of the old housing that's been rehabbed, and they want to create a, a really upwardly mobile, upscale community, but it just isn't happening because things are so slow. What they fail to realize when they moved into this community is that there are both a number of programs and a number of, of uh, families here who are, are, uh, are, are supportive and, and are, are the, the life stream for people exiting prison. So in our zip code on any given day, there are about 700 formerly incarcerated men and women in our 60612 zip code. St. Leonard's Ministries is a relatively small portion of, of these ex-offenders. So the, the new people who come into the community are the ones who, who want to, to would, would like to get rid of us, or as one person said, well, you're doing a good job, but we don't want you to get any bigger. So um, that's the struggle that we've had with, with NIMBY. And it's come, quite frankly, as a surprise. When I first came to St. Leonard's, um, I, I assumed that the biggest difficulty we would have would be how to develop programming and how to get funds for those kinds of things and how to deal with people who've been in and out of prison in some cases a number of times. And in my early years here, those were issues, but they have become the, the thing that you know is just part of every day. What's become the hardest issue is the, the, the pot shots from the community, and sometimes you just don't know where they're coming from. And I think when Anne originally described our, both our presentations, uh, Joanna and mine, as success stories, <clears throat> the success is, is one that you almost measure, let's say, day by day or year by year, because you know that, boy, something could happen or, or this can happen, or you, you, sometimes you're just not sure what's going on out there in the community. So um, it, it's, uh, this whole NIMBY question has made my existence here and has made really the situation of St. Leonard's uh, less secure than it was for the first, let's say, almost 50 years of its existence. So I want to share with you, I, I divided my thoughts into, into two components. One is the easy stuff that we've done at St. Leonard's, uh, the, what do they call it, the low-hanging fruit, the stuff that can happen. Um, when I came to St. Leonard's, it, it looked like... Um, it looked like um, Joanne described the castle. It was in pretty bad shape. The, the door to the administration building, which was a coach house in the rear, when you opened it, bricks would literally fall out. So I realized we had to do something to, to make the place look better. My real thought was I wanted it to look better for the residents who lived here, our program participants. But I also realized that if we were going to remain in this community, we had to look good. So a very simple thing that I did, this was almost as much therapy for me as it was for uh, appearances, we began to make great use of the green space, the garden space around the building. We're fortunate to have a nice courtyard in the middle that was just ripe for, for tilling the soil and for growing things, and the more flowers, the better, and, and we, we were able to get help from all kinds of resources, the Botanic Garden here in Chicago, and at that time the mayor had an office for... for uh, developing community gardens. So we were able to do this very simple thing that cost us almost nothing or very little. We were able to 
get volunteers to help. But within a year or two, the place simply began to look better physically. So new people in the community could hardly complain that they didn't want us because of the way we looked. We actually, three years in the last ten years, we've won third prize in the mayor's urban landscape. So those things helped a lot. I also took a look at the, the physical nature of the buildings and realized what they needed stuff like, like tuck pointing and, and the roof drains and all those things. And of course, our budget's are much smaller than, 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 than probably the, even the average size agency. So we were able to, uh, had to look to the city. We were able to get block grants and, and little by little we began to put in new windows and make the building look like something that one would be proud to live next to or that as one drove up and down the street, you could point to it and say, gee, that place looks good. The other uh, relatively easy thing that I did, and I've um, come, kind of become known here, in, as we said, in the house as the Banshee, is we simply don't allow people to loiter outside our fence. And this is staff, this is residents, this is anybody who comes to visit us. The, the, the motto is, get in the yard. So we have this nice yard, people are happy, welcome to, to sit and talk and all that. But there, there's something about that loitering that, that instills doubt or fear or what have you in, in, in the minds of people. So we, we just don't allow people to do that. What we do is encourage people to do all their gathering inside, and, and we find that, that that does a lot, really, to, to, to make us look better in terms of the community, but it also helps individuals who live with us realize that, you know, you, you just can't be hanging around. So um, what you see on the screen now is our mission statement, and it talks about creating a setting and of the setting that, that we hope to create with our program participants is is one that, that uh, is welcoming to them, but also welcoming to the community. So another, I think, fairly easy thing that we did was we began having a summer picnic. Now, the first time we had the picnic, I was worried about, gee, who's going to come to the picnic? And, and we thought, you know, maybe nobody will show up. Well, you know, provide a meal and the whole world is your audience. So the summer picnic has become this, this gathering for, for everybody in the community. Some are new people in the community. Some are people who have been in the community a long time. And some, quite frankly, are, are homeless people that, that hear about a picnic and come. But it does allow people to come onto our grounds, and it does allow people to, to get a sense of, of what's happening from a different perspective. And a fairly easy, uh, easy activity, a fairly easy thing to do. So... Uh, the easy stuff bears long-standing fruit, and the easy stuff, uh, while it seems simple, really becomes part of of, uh, of helping uh, an institution like St. Leonard's uh, become uh, a part of the community in a number of different ways. So we've worked on those things, and we continue to work on them. All of our grounds, when we put up a new building, when we've done something different, we've always said, you know, what can we do to, to make it look good? What can we do in terms of the... Uh, the, the simple gardening related to the facility. Now, uh, the not-so-easy stuff that we've had to do, and, and again, we're a small agency, so we don't have a lot of staff that, that I can dedicate to advocacy or that I can dedicate to, to a PR. Um, we really don't currently have a full-time development person, so each of us on staff does a number of different uh, duties. But So these not-so-easy things weren't always easy to pull off. But one of the things, of course, that we had to do is get some kind of connection with our aldermen. The city of Chicago is divided into, I think, 48 or 50 wards, and the aldermen becomes very, very powerful. So we had to go to all the political meetings that we could with the aldermen. We had to invite the aldermen to come out and be a part of our programming. We, um, After we finished developing all the housing, we then um, built the Michael Barlow Employment Center, so we have graduations there. Well, six or eight graduations a year, so we've invited the aldermen to come and be a part of what happens in, in terms of the graduations. So the alderman relationship was, was critical. It was very, very important for us, and, and we work hard at that. We also have gone into the local schools. Uh, the population of ex-offenders um, has a lot to say to young people who are at critical times in their lives. So um, we often will go in at the invitation of a principal or of a teacher, but we've also reached out into the schools to suggest that when they have uh, group meetings or if they're interested in a presentation about, uh, in quotes, why not to go to prison, uh, that, that our program participants 
participants can have a lot to say. So that's been very fruitful. The other thing we've done that cost us a little bit of money was uh, develop a, an active mailing address for people who live right across the street from us, all up and down the block. And this at first cost a lot of money. Now the, the United States Post Office has a program called Every Door Direct Mail, where, where you can do a mailing for every every block within six blocks of a given address, and and they'll they'll put a mailing in there to those those addresses. So we realize that that the new people coming into the neighborhood need to find out about us, and they need to find out about us from us, not from from other people. So this direct mailing has been has been really very helpful. Uh, the other thing we've done is worked hard at community newspapers. Sometimes people say, yeah, who reads them? But a lot of people read the community newspapers. So we've done a great deal of work over a period of time with uh, inviting the neighborhood newspapers to come in to do stories about uh, our program participants, to do stories about our, our Michael Barlow Employment Center. And it has paid off quite a bit. It, it's, it's always very good when I go to a community meeting to be able to to pass out some information that, that the newspaper did about us, not us. Um, we've, uh, we try to attend all the neighborhood meetings that we can. The biggest one here in Chicago that's important for us is the community policing meeting, the CAPS meeting that takes place once a month. And we go to that meeting, and sometimes we're there as silent partners. Sometimes we're there just to combat the, the, the complaints about all those ex-offenders that are supposed to be in the neighborhood, how people know who they are or who they aren't, I don't know much less how they know who belongs to St. Leonard's and who doesn't. But but it's critical for us to take the time to be at those meetings. And as we all know, they're often at night or in, in times when, when most of the staff would rather go home. But it's really important to be there. And then the other thing that, that we've more recently begun to do is to, to, to invite some of the individuals in the community who are not in favor of us, to invite them to come to our board meetings and listen to our board of directors speak. Um, when I talk, it's, in some ways, it's, it's almost ingratiating. It's like I'm talking just to keep my job. But the board of directors doesn't do that. So um, it's it's um, very important that, that people come in and see who who's the governing body in this, this agency and, and this uh, entity. So we invite them to come to meetings. Um, I'm going to close. That, that's really probably about all I have to say about NIMBY, although I, I think, and I, uh, Joanne alluded to this, I think the one thing that's very important is the whole idea of concessions. Um, you know, most of us, when we design programs, we know what we want and we know what works, but it doesn't work in isolation. So the, the whole notion of making concessions to this community in which we sit is, is very important. Um, just a, a small example of that, I, I look out my window and across the street there's a, a vacant lot that could maybe house two, two homes if they're on it, but it's been an abandoned lot. And it was in, in quite a bit of a, just didn't look very good. So I thought, well, gee, if we could get that from the city, we could make a parking lot out of it for our staff. Well, the people in the community would have sworn we were going to build a 500-bed prison. And it became quite clear that they just didn't want us to have this. And I wasn't exactly sure how strong the alderman was willing to come and, and speak for us. So I thought to myself, you know, a parking lot isn't worth fighting over. If the community doesn't want us to have that for a parking lot, we won't have it for a parking lot. So, and there were some people on my board that thought we were conceding too much. But I think part of this, the whole notion is what what's really worth fighting for and what isn't. And, and uh, the concession process is an important part of it. So thank you very much. And that ends my uh, remarks. Bob, thank you. Bob, Joanne, Alvin, thank you very much for your for your comments. Um, we have questions that I'm going to do my best to um, direct your way. And one of the questions, Alvin, I think is particularly for you to to, to answer. Alvin, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Can, okay. Just a little bit closer to the mic, okay? So the, the Can you question hear me better, is. Ben? Much better. Thank you, Alvin. Okay, there you go. So the question is, what empowered you in your life to say that you needed to make a change? Um, the person who was asking the question was reflecting on, I think, their experience of working with some people who don't seem to have gotten to that point yet and wondering, you know, what in their term an outsider can do to um, help or motivate um, 
someone to take a stand for making some changes in their life. And so our question to you is if there's something about your own process that can help um, us think about that. Yes. Um, and this is Anne, right? Yep. Okay, that's well, a very good question. everybody, actually. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, but the question, yeah. And the parole board asked that question, you know, like, what is it? Uh, because, like, while you're in, a man has to make, a man or a woman has to make an individual choice. I'm 53 years old. It was my second time inside. So, you know, you do the same things, you get the same results. You have to make a, a, a personal decision to just do the right thing. And if you're not totally committed to that change, it probably won't work. Uh, what made it easier for me was that, okay, I've gotten older, i served a lot of time, and I wanted a change. I mean, I really, really needed a change. And that was that was all I needed. I mean, to just make up my mind, I have to do the right thing. And having the support team, the family, um, that's, that's what one needs. Um, so that, for me, that was the main thing, making that personal choice that this has to be done or else you're doomed to repeat the same thing again. And at my age, um, that was definitely a no-no. Thank you. I'd like so, to add to yes. that if I could, though. Yes. That I believe that the nature of the population that, that we're talking about and the population with whom we're working, um, many of them are, haven't reached the, the, the maturity that, that, Calvin, that, that you speak so eloquently to. So I think we have to be committed to realizing that, that, that there's a risk and not everybody's going to be an Alvin. And not everybody's going to be an Alvin the first time we get that person. So we have to be willing to maybe, if we believe in second chances, to realize that it's more than a number, it's a philosophy. Now that's fine for us, but it's very hard sometimes to convey that to the community. That that it, it's taken a 35 year old person who's been in and out of prison three or four times, 35 years to get where he is. It isn't gonna there isn't gonna be an overnight change. So there's there's both hope that there will be, but there's also this this realization that there's a risk inherent in what we do. But unless we take that risk people are doomed to not have the chances that they need. I think that, this is Joanne speaking, I think there are two thoughts I'd like to share. One is that I've been doing this work for a long time, and now that we have housing in the mix, I can't imagine how we live without it, because housing is transformative, and when people are struggling to stay balanced, and stay with those commitments, or to make them for the first time, if you're living with them, if you can wrap services around them, if you can notice when things start going wrong, I think that having housing in the mix greatly increases people's odds. The other thing is that mostly we're dealing with people who've been struggling with the same issues for decades, sometimes multi-generational issues. And what we've learned is that there's no quick fix, that we have a commitment to people when they walk in our doors, that it's a lifetime commitment, and that we will keep taking them back as long as they're willing to live peaceably in our community. We will keep taking them back as many times as we need to until it works. And as long as we're holding the safety for the community, I think it's something that can be done without jeopardizing community support. So one of the things that strikes me when I listen to both Bob and Joanne talk is that the community opposition, the way that you dealt with it, was not just a burden that you had to bear and something that you had to get through so that you could get on to doing what you know, you started off really knowing you wanted to do, but rather it was something that you took time to understand and to more authentically engage with, and that it actually in some significant measure probably changed some of the things that you did. Um, Joanne, I wonder if, if you, you know, as someone who has had both experiences, I wonder if you could um, distinguish it, you know, just a little bit more for us. Because if this is hard enough work, and then when you know that starts happening, it's really hard to expand or include it. I think. No, what we did was say very openly who we were and what we were doing right from the beginning. So we told people who we housed. People asked us if we keep people out with violent convictions or sex offenders out, and we said we look at everybody, whole picture, so we won't keep out a person based on their particular crime, we will make sure that we feel their people can live safety, safely in the community. I think being that honest up front was part of the reason we had so much opposition initially, but it also meant that we built trust because we weren't being sneaky at all. 
Um, for me, it was actually a journey that was very moving because to see people go from fighting us to beginning to trust us to reaching out and asking us for help with their loved ones was really moving. Uh, so I learned a lot about building trust and being honest and that people will come around if you're making their community better as a result. Uh, so it, it's been a moving journey. The second leg of the journey, though, was where we had community support because we were providing the community with something that it needed. And it was a whole different story. There were funding sources we could approach. There was the ability to show community support as we were looking for support from elected officials. So it took us 10 years to build that, though. It wasn't a slow process, and it's a labor-intensive process. But I think it's a rather beautiful process. It's a process of being a good neighbor. So, Bob, I loved what you said about concessions and choosing your battles, you know, and, and being clear about what's worth fighting for. I wonder if you have anything to add um, to what Joanne has said at this point in the conversation. Well, I think I'm at the other end of the spectrum. It just really annoys the heck out of me to have to worry about stuff like this because I know we're doing something good. As with any program that works with ex-offenders, if you do, you can reduce recidivism by these, these wonderful numbers. You, you, you can help people renew their lives. So I've got somebody down the block that doesn't like this or doesn't like that. So, And for us, um, I'm going to use this as a defense. Again, as I say, we were situated here for such a long time, very happily, in the community. We were even located here when, when the riots broke out after Dr. King's death, and there were fires everywhere, but none of, none of them touched St. Leonard's. So we were always welcomed in the community. So now when this new crew comes in and, and makes us kind of feel unwanted, that's very, very hard for me. So I'm not yet at the stage that, that Joanne, that you so eloquently described, although we don't have a choice. We've got to get there. So I can sit up in my office and say, you know, thumb my nose at the neighbors, but I'll, I'll be kicked out of the office pretty quick, as will the whole program. So what you've outlined, I think, is just an excellently put approach to the whole thing, and, and we're moving in that direction. We're trying to, to do more and more to, to, to have uh, an advisory board in the community and those things, but I'm just not there yet. <laughs> Thanks for being honest. So, Alvin... One of yes. the things that strikes me when I listen to the fortune story is how the role of the client or the participant ended up being perhaps better defined or or redefined as as it related to um, the role of being a person in that community. Um, can you say something about how you or how you and your colleagues understand the kind of role and responsibility that you have as it relates to being a, a resident in the community? Well, for me, I'm, you know, if I can, I'm speaking for myself, but just the whole fortune concept is a supportive concept. So I'm going to, you know, put myself out there and say I'm going to speak for the residents of fortune because I was and I am a resident of fortune. We are we're our own support team, and we're, we, we're almost responsible for one another. It's like if, if, if one guy messes up, it's like we all do, and he's responsible for himself, but, I mean, you know, we all feel it. You know, if a guy relapses and, and, and takes a drink, we all feel it. So we have to support him and keep him, you know, on the straight and narrow. I was afraid to go shopping when I first came home. I had two people from the academy say, Al, I'll go with you because I was, I was fearful. Just a metro car, so you have this whole support thing, like just like the village raising a child, and that's what the academy is like. It's like you know we're all family, you know. And um, our community meetings, that's when you have that concept right there. When you come and sit in one of our meetings, you'll see it's like the whole support system, you know. So we're responsible for one another. And you know, I just wanted to add one thing. It's not just the the whole reentry thing, but since upwards of 90% of the population in prison, they're coming out. You know, they, that starts from inside. You know, once the man makes up his mind that he has to do the right thing, but they need the programs inside also that's going to help support him in, you know, like uh, in this reentry. You know, it starts from inside also. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So one of um, our listeners has asked the question whether 
Um, any of your programs are state licensed community correctional facilities or federally funded RRCs. And whether, if they are or not, whether you have any thoughts about the differences in community public relations when trying to cite those types of facilities. So we are not, we're actually very careful not to be a correctionally oriented place because we describe this in the consensual relationship to our clients. Uh, I think it's harder because what Alvin just described is part of why when people from the community walk in our doors, they feel warm and welcome. We really have a community that people have chosen to be a part of, which makes it easier. I think that there are bigger challenges when it is a correctional facility. Uh, I think that the part about going to community meetings, though, holds, and the idea of trying to have daylight enter your place holds. We went out of our way to make our meeting spaces available to the community, and we actually have community board meetings happening frequently during the month. If that's possible, I think that makes a big difference because when people are coming into your building to take care of their business and when elected officials are coming into your building to try to get community support, it makes a big difference in terms of people's sense of security about what you're doing. Well, the other thing that occurs to me is that sometimes there is an unwitting or unintended kind of reaction within the community to seeing law enforcement, um, particularly in uniform. So and sometimes what goes along with citing um, more governmentally oriented um, programs or, or residences in a community is also that the staff associated with them look very official and very law enforcement -y in a way that, you know, unintentionally can cause some anxiety um, and or resistance in communities that feel disproportionately affected by law enforcement. Um, yeah, so when I was talking about no loitering, imagine going out and trying to tell a parole officer not to loiter out in front. <laughs> but, in fact, we've had to do that. At St. Leonard's, we, we receive a large uh, source of our funding through Title 20 funding, which comes through the Department of Corrections. So while we receive a large amount of funding from them, it's not the tail that wags the dog. We are our, our own program, and people are here, um, we always say, as guests. We actually, for a while, were the only site in Chicago licensed to house sex offenders. Uh, we went through that process. We stopped housing sex offenders, not because we didn't have good success with them. We had fairly good success with one recent notable exception, but the Department of Corrections was using us as another prison. So they would send a sex offender here and not give that person any movement and have them stay forever. So we just said, no, that we don't want to do. We don't want to just be another prison. So um, I, I think, uh, Joanne, you're right. There are some some uh, things to be very careful of with licensing by, by the, any corrections institution. We, in fact, have gotten several questions about what about sex offenders, in part, I think, because they are such a difficult population to house. I wonder if if um, you could elaborate, um, Bob, on what you were doing that was successful and Joanne then contribute your thinking to what might make sense. Well, for the last um, 10 to 12 years, we, had a, a, we have a really good linkage with the Adler School of Professional Psychology here in Chicago. And the Adler School actually works with the Illinois prison system with some of their sex offender treatment. So we had just an excellent program between 2000 and 2000, oh, maybe nine. We had about 70 sex offenders come through our program, and only three went back to prison. And of those three, two were parole violations. So one was actually the commission of a new crime. So we had a really good, um, I think, track record, not so much because of us, although certainly my staff was very good with this population, but because of this connection with the Adler School. So we were able to do some really good in-depth work. Um, but as I say, it, it became, uh, we became just another prison, and I just did not want to do that. Now, that may change, but uh, currently that's where we're at. And was the recidivism, the case that you talked about being rearrested, was it for a sex offense? Or yes. Mm -hmm. 
Because one of the things that struck me recently in, in reading research on sex offenders is that the recidivism rate in general is very low and the recidivism that exists is um, you know, often for other than sexual offenses. And this surprised me. You can be or a parole violation. I was surprised. So I feel like there's a lot that even those of us who do this work have to learn about the reality of, of the challenges. That are well, faced. depending on who you listen to and what study you, you quote, it, it, it's maybe as small as 10% of the sex offender population is going to be a population that needs constant watching it, it that needs supervision, that, that is predatory. But I was interested in... in um, uh, Joanna, what you're you're doing, you have you do do accept sex offenders, and you've leveled off the, the uh, commission of crime. Well, you know what we do is we treat everybody the same. We look at records. It's one of the things we look at. We look at whether we think that we would be creating a risk to the community by taking this person in, and if we do, we won't take them in. But we also have a strong enough culture that we really bring down the level of risk because people are living in our community and there are some pretty strong expectations and some very strong supports. So the issue about sex offenders for us is that once we've done an initial screen for risk, for example, we wouldn't take somebody who is a predatory pedophile in a community that's chock full of children. But we, when we, we're an advocacy organization as well, and many of the practices and many of the laws that we're seeing around sex offenders are counter to evidence and counter to public safety. So we testify about that. Yeah. The residency requirements increase risk to the community because they concentrate people. Uh, Megan's law has been examined by New Jersey, which promulgated it, and they're finding it's expensive and doesn't work. So we try to be out there speaking that way. But we will take sex offenders. We put an extra level of screening in, partially for our own protection because of community response. And we've taken some heat for some of the people that we've taken in. But we're extremely careful on the community safety issue. So one of the listeners asked whether either of you have ever had a, kind of a, a disaster, a public relations disaster. And if so, how did you handle it? We did about a year and a half, two years ago now, and um, it had to do with people in the community. And, well, first, you know, I, I notified the, our board of directors and all our, our funders, and, and um, then actually it, it, it soon moved into a lawsuit, which um, then forced us to be um, careful about what we said because of the pending lawsuit. But it was very, very difficult. The, the, the most difficult part of it was, the demoralizing nature that it had on on um, staff and on, on everybody. So it was it was uh, one thing the external uh, force of this difficulty, but the other thing was the internal uh, situation. And so what did you conclude going forward? Uh, I'm sorry. What do we conclude? Yeah. Did you make some sort of significant change? And no, I think the, the, the nature of what or? happened was it just uh, it happened. Um, you know, I, I don't know that there was anything we could have done differently. Um, it just, the situation just arose out of the nature of, of, of the population and the risk that you take and, you know, you, you while you do all those things that even that, that, that Joanne, that you were mentioning, the different levels of, of scrutiny, you can still do that and stuff happens. So I think it's the idea of, of being ready for it and being being not weighed down by the, the one difficult situation versus the hundreds of hundreds of others, and, and helping staff get through that, helping the board get through that, and then being able to to face the community, which wasn't always easy. Go ahead, Joanna. Yeah, you know, I think that if you're doing this work, you're going to have some people who commit new crimes. It's the nature of it, and I think a nonprofit is better able to handle that than government in some ways. Yes. Um, We've had some instances they didn't hit the media in a big way, but the the issue that had the biggest media for us was when we took in somebody who had a very, very widely publicized case where he killed his own daughter, then did a couple of decades in prison, and the parole board begged us to take him in because nobody else would. We looked at him, we looked at his age, we looked at his risk, which was almost non-existent. 
and we decided to take him in. And we had what I call kamikaze level media. We had helicopters overhead. We had news, news people oh, okay. sleeping in the edges. Um, we were on the they were doing live feeds from our doorstep, and it was like riding a tsunami. It was amazing. But what we ended up doing was just coming from a principal place and saying, when people come out, they're going to live somewhere. And isn't it better to have somebody live in a place where there are supports and where there's supervision? Uh, so we ended up weathering it, and I think we ended up being respected for it. Although there are some people who still are upset that we took them, even though it's many years later. But I think part of our job is to, to stand on principle and really look at risk and do an assessment based on risk rather than on fear. Thank you. So there are a number of just kind of clarifying questions that have come through that I want to ask you to, um, you know, just address very quickly. And then we've also gotten a lot of questions that have to do with a little bit more detail on the, the, the other services that you provide, um, you know, how you deal with employment and um, other needs that, that a returning person might have. So first of all, the question is, do um, people pay rent in either of your facilities? At St. Leonard's? Yes, in ours. Yeah. Okay. It generally, yes for you? Yes. So what happens is when they come into the emergency housing, they have no income and they pay no rent. But once they move into the phase permanent housing, they're paying 30% of income. Yeah, that's the same with us. Grace House and St. Leonard's House that are first stage the no fees are attached, but in the second stage housing, uh, I'm going to use your term to end, in the phased permanent housing, they pay 30% of their income. So, um, and Bob, related to the Title 20 um, funding you talked about, could you just say a little bit more about how someone would learn more about it and whether it's national or or more local source of funding? Yes, I'd be happy to. It is, by the way, fairly untroubled funding. The turnaround time for payment is very good. Uh, it's, it has a lengthy uh, contract application, but it's well worth it. Title 20 money is funding that comes from Washington, national funding, to each state, and it's for non-entitlement programs. So it's kind of for extra social service programs that, that, that uh, citizens aren't entitled to. In Illinois, it goes through the Illinois Department of Human Services in our, in our capital. And I, I can't begin to imagine how it happens in other states, but I think uh, the state capital would be a good place to go and to find out what's the, the um, focal point for Title 20 funding. So some of the questions have related to what your relationships are, particularly with parole but maybe more generally with corrections, if people are coming to you, you know, directly from from um, um, a prison or a jail, and, you know, how how you kind of define your, your responsibilities as it relates to them. Would you, for instance, um, report to parole if you knew someone was in violation of one of the conditions of their parole? We actually have been very, very careful about our definitions. We're not a correctional facility, and we're very clear that we're not that. And we're also not a condition of parole, and we're very careful to make that so. We've on a several occasions chosen not to apply for funding from parole and had conversations with parole where we basically said most of the people we're going to house are going to be parolees. And in exchange, and we don't want your money, in exchange for taking parolees, we want a parole officer assigned to the house who's treatment-oriented. And having a parole officer who is the PO for most of our clients, who really works with us, I think has increased the odds of people and really brought down the risk of technical violations. And we do share information back and forth, but there also is information that's confidential that's held in the counseling session. Well, I think at St. Leonard's we try to walk a fine line. We, uh, we see ourselves as partners with the Department of Corrections, but that's surely a mixed bag because I would say Eight out of ten parole agents we really don't want to partner with. Um, but we, we see that as it's, it's kind of a necessary evil for us. But we try to approach it from where we stand, not being told what to do by where they are. So um, that, that's a question about reporting people. We, we try not to do that. Uh, there are some natural consequences. If a person doesn't report to a parole agent, that's beyond 
what we can do uh, because they have to do that. Um, probably at St. Leonard's House, probably eight out of ten are on parole from the Department, Illinois Department of Corrections. But they they have respect for what we do. We try to know people even while they're still in prison. So there is this connection there, but but it's definitely a mixed bag, definitely. So, Bob, I and, and I'm, can I can I just add something with regard to parole? Uh, when I was coming out, you know, you need a place to stay. I should go to a shelter. And when I had written to Fortune and talked to Glenn Martin over the phone, they sent me a letter of what they call a letter of reasonable assurance. And what that says is that we will take this person in and assure that he gets the program that he needs. The parole mandates that he has to do this and this and this, we will make sure that he takes those programs. And when I went to the parole board with that letter of reasonable assurance, um, Bob, you're just saying it's that level of respect. Uh, they respect Fortune. They said, "Oh, you have a letter of reasonable assurance from Fortune," and that, you know, that was a, a good, a good look for me. So they do have a level of respect when you're coming out and yeah. going to an agency like yours, uh, Fortune. We rarely commit to housing, and yours was one case where we did because we have such a huge demand for it. But when we do commit to housing, it greatly increases people's odds of getting out. Yes, it does. <laughs> I want to go back to something Bob said, because I imagine that there are um, um, parole and probation people who are listening in and, you know, who, you know, may have, like, taken note when you made your statement about um, generally not wanting to work with parole. I wonder if you could flesh out just a little bit more about the distinction you're making between that officer that you do work really productively with and the ones that you were otherwise referring to. It's almost a it's almost a personality trait. Here in Illinois, many not all many parole agents are prison guards who who have gone up in the rank, so to speak, and now are prison guards out in the community, and now they carry a gun. And many of them are more interested in getting people back into prison than keeping people out of prison. Now, in some ways, I, I don't want to be glib here. I, I understand that's not an easy job. But in some ways, it has to do with the numbers. In some, for some cases, it's just a lack of a different training, a lack of developing a new perspective. And then in some ways, it's very practical that, that parole agents are, are rotated so frequently that they, they have little opportunity to know about resources in a given community because they're not there long enough to develop the resources uh, to which they can refer their, their parolees. So it, it's, it's a really difficult situation. Um, I think the, the, the two out of ten that we prefer working with are people who have a good sense of, of, of the population, have a good sense of what's serious in terms of an infraction and what isn't, and when a person should be sent back and when a person should be just um, worked with to get through something. And then, you know, it's the obvious elephant in the middle of the room, the addictions, the substance abuse that is so problematic. Um, and, and some... Uh, some parole agents are less willing to do referrals than, than others and, and, and aren't willing to even address that issue. What we found is that having a PO who's treatment-oriented assigned to the caseload in our building has really made a difference in terms of program model. That and is a great situation. Graduate, yeah, when people move into the community, we've had an occasion to intervene to keep somebody from having to leave their job or leave their home because the new parole officer imposed different rules on them. Yeah, yeah, that's... So the teamwork, when it works, I think greatly increases people's odds. Yeah. Thank you. So there is another cluster of questions that have to do with um, people who um, may have castle envy but not be in a position to acquire, you know, a substantial piece of, of real estate and who are looking for other options for housing um, the population that we're talking about. So one of the questions is, how do you encourage housing authorities, um, and how do you deal with um, other providers of existing housing to orient them to being a little more receptive to a population with a criminal conviction? Uh, you know, the, the, the housing regulations only exclude people who are lifetime registrants with uh, life, lifetime registered sex offenders and people who manufacture methamphetamine on You're public housing. You're talking about the federal guidelines. Yeah, the, federal the rest is local. 
And, and we do advocacy around trying to to ease people's ability to get into public housing. You know, we got really lucky here in Chicago. The Chicago Housing Authority is going to give us funding for 17 units of permanent housing in a project that, that we're co-developing with someone else. Here's the kicker. That was just monumental that the CHA would be willing to do that. It was a great step forward. But then HUD said, oh, it's okay, but you can't use it just for women. That's against fair housing laws. So you open one door and close another. Um, but uh, I digress with that. It was just the frustration of getting that, that great housing thing. But, you know, bigger isn't always better. Um, I have almost once a month somebody comes here, we want to start a program like St. Leonard's, and I say, well, don't even try it. Just get a small house somewhere in the city where you can house five or six people, and you have to absolutely first get the alderman's support. If you don't have that, it ain't going nowhere. And then once you get the alderman's support, and once you get this location, then housing, then, then money will present itself from foundations. You'll be able to get local colleges and universities to help with some of the programming. The big thing is getting that location, that site where the alderman says, yes, it's going to be, and then it'll go forward at a smaller scale. The other alternative is to, if you can purchase a small property, and this is a good time in the real estate market, get something zoned as of right for what you need to do. Yeah. Because as we were advised, you'll never have community support when you move in. You need to build it over time. But doing something zoned as of right lets you start. Yeah. So, uh, Joanne, your initial comments um, reminded me that also on the um, National Reentry Resource Center website is a link to the National Reentry Council, which has a series of publications called Mythbusters. And this is a, a, a series where they have looked at things that we commonly knew is true and may um, not be supported in, the, in federal law. One of them relates to this issue of, of um, housing authorities and what they can and cannot allow. So I encourage you to check out the Mythbusters series and to um, outreach to your housing authority. We have seen in any number of jurisdictions people being willing to move. Um, they operate under a set of assumptions about what they can and can't do, and part of you know their educational process is a conversation that can lead to new possibilities in the kinds of experiments that Bob was talking about. And you mentioned something about some people have questions about employment. I left something out. In, in addition to housing and, and case management and everything that goes with it and the referrals, we also five years ago opened the Michael Barlow Center, which is our version of a school. It was new construction, and it's a school with the, the sole purpose in mind of getting people jobs. So we have two skills training classes, one in culinary skills, the other in green building maintenance, the, as you'd expect, the computer lab, an alternative high school program rather than a GED, and then, of course, the job developer who is paired off with the retention counselor so that it's not just getting the job, but it's helping somebody keep the job. So that for us was kind of the, the, the closing of the circle of needs of, of housing, but but also uh, giving people the wherewithal to pay for the housing. And I think wraparound services are really essential, yeah. however you get there. Yes. You need you to deal with employment issues, mental health issues, uh, substance abuse, the range of issues people are coming with. Mm -hmm. Either by being able to provide services in-house or by making connections with other community services. Because those questions, you know, could be the, the uh, a topic of their own webinar, I um, have not spent a lot of time on them today, but rather would refer people to the websites for both Bob and Joanne's organizations where they deal in more detail with the other services that they provide. Yes, great. I, I want, before we leave the, the issue of local housing authorities, though, this is a particularly compelling question. What is the best way to approach local housing authorities in a very small rural community? I've met with great resistance at the mention of any kind of criminal record. Uh, a moment about what we're seeing with our own housing authority. To the extent that you're speaking to issues they already recognize as problems, you'll find a more open door. And what we find is that people are living under the radar who have criminal justice histories, and that's not in their interest. So bringing it out in a way that, in a sense, lets people earn citizenship is something that appeals to their needs as well. 
Yeah. And, you know, the, the other thing for me is always the, the obvious question is, what? where's the better instance of a person who needs public housing than somebody exiting prison with no resources? I mean, who, who more than that person needs public housing? They haven't even had a chance... To, to lose a job because they haven't gotten a job. That, that the need is just so compelling with this population that that something, even a small step, has to be taken in that direction. Well, I don't think that the resistance comes from a lack of getting the need. I think that it more often comes from a concern for the risk that goes along with meeting the need. And you know, not just the kind of liability issues. I mean, you talked earlier yourself about being sued but concern for the others who might live, you know, in that housing authority. Well, I think that's so, what I meant by small step, you know. So, mm-hmm. so realize that, that every ex-offender, is not, it, there's no monolith, that there's different degrees and levels and all that. So, so, so they could, so some inroads could be made. The Legal Action Center has some really good state-by-state examinations of public housing and what the, what the ways are that people can prove rehabilitation. And that might be useful. The yeah. Legal Action Center website can be helpful. Well, I wonder if there isn't some, you know, general kind of uh, wrap-up statement that each of you would like to make. We're getting to the close, the end of our time. But the part of it that, that I'm kind of left with is that it's, it's in response to the, the question that you were just addressing. So often the people that we know who've been formerly incarcerated are not the people that the general public thinks that they are. Um, you know, the sense of risk, of recidivism, of, of, of them being alien um, is, is exaggerated, to say the least. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about how you bring, um, you know, how you speak to that, how you bridge that kind of gap, how you help people who don't come into contact with with people with criminal histories on a regular basis, help them have a more kind of reality and, I would say, you know, helpful um, perspective on it. I think just put a face on people. Alvin, as our ambassador, having formerly incarcerated staff go to those meetings, those are the ways we've tried to do it at Fortune. We have a religious connection with the Episcopal Diocese here in Chicago, and we invite parishes to come and have a meal with us. Now, we have more food than we know what to do with, but they bring a meal that kind of gives them something to do. But invariably, it changes people's perceptions once mm-hmm. they've sat across the table from someone who is this, in quotes, ex-offender. But, uh, now, those are small steps, but I don't know how else we can do it. We also have the expectation that our board of directors, we have a fairly large board, 28 for an agency our size, but the expectation is that they become ambassadors for the people who come into our programs. Well, and I just have to say, drawing on my experience when I was the executive director of the Women's Prison Association, it was transformational for everybody involved when we would just take the general public to prison. Um, We were able, through the the generosity of a superintendent in the Department of Corrections, to bring people in on regular, you know, on a on a regular basis, and they just had a chance to sit and talk yeah. to um, people who are incarcerated, and they always left saying they're not who I thought that they were. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well put. So on that note, um, I want to thank each of the panelists, Alvin, Joanne, and Bob, um, and the Council of State Government's National Reentry Resource Center for allowing us to spend this time with you today. And Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. This concludes today's webinar. After you exit the webinar, a brief survey will appear on the screen. By answering the questions in the survey, you will be helping the Resource Center improve on the services we offer. We'd greatly appreciate it if you would take just a few minutes to complete the survey. We will email a link to the recording of this presentation, as well as a link to a PDF of the PowerPoint slides used in the presentation late this week or early next week. These links will also be made available on the National Reentry Resource Center's website at www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org.